It's a story of redemption. A story of a woman who encountered Jesus in a way that changed her whole life. And I want it to be a story where you and I resonate with her story. That is to say, what's your story? You have a story too. And God by His Spirit knows you by name and continually seeks in a whole variety of ways to speak to your heart in a way that reignites your faith and draws your spirit close to His Spirit so He can quench the thirst in your soul. What's your God story? You see, there are in our lives moments where God touches us and then there are moments where God wants to use the flame of your faith to bless other people. We might call it a divine appointment. What words, what thoughts come to mind when you hear those two simple words, divine appointment? Have you ever been late for a, an important appointment? Have you ever had somebody that pulled together an appointment and all you had to do was show up and when you got there, it changed your life? A divine appointment, I would say, is a moment planned by God to touch you with grace in a way that allows you to breathe deep. And from that point on, it's a point of reference. And you know you're not the same person from that moment on because God has touched your life somehow. It's a divine appointment. It might be seemingly random, might be an insignificant casual meeting, but it can be a God moment for you. And God may use you to create a God moment for someone else. So sometimes when we look in the rearview mirror, we think, well, God, that was you, wasn't it? You were there. You were trying to get through my little Norwegian skull to both those brain cells that are in there and light them up. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about this story. Scripture would say that this is an immoral woman. I find it easy, even as your preacher, now this is my confession, I find it easy to be dismissive of people that don't walk the talk like I do or flow in the rhythm of life among the church people. It's easy to just let go of them, and I somehow in my brain think I don't have a responsibility to love them. This was an immoral woman. You might define immorality as departing deliberately from principles of right and wrong. Do you know people like that? Not adhering to ethical principles. Morally unprincipled. A bad person. A bad character. Depraved. Perverted even. Deviating from the good. Immoral. So I want you to think about two different women as possible. Woman number one, she's flirtatious, coquettish. She uses her, her sexuality to climb a ladder. She gives herself away to profit personally. She's ingrained in methods of manipulation and control. And man after man are left in her wake after she's done with them. Women dislike her, distrust her, are wary when she's around because of how she carries herself. But here's woman number two. She had a painful early life. Her dad struggled with booze. She has a tense and cold relationship with her mother. She experienced things a little girl shouldn't experience at a young age. She's been a part of an abusive household, and now she views herself as dirt. She has a skewed vision of relationships. She has difficulty trusting, and somehow she seems to sabotage every love relationship. Anger seems to simmer right under the surface, waiting to explode. Do you know what these two women share in common? They're both lonely. 
They're both lost. They're both outcasts. They're both alienated from others, and they don't like themselves. Which do you suppose is the background of the woman at the well? Or maybe some other story. So here she is drawing water at the well at noon. Not the common time for women to draw water, but then she doesn't hang with other ladies in her village. Jesus says, could you give me a drink? And it rouses her curiosity about why he, as a Jewish man, would even speak to her, a Samaritan, let alone a Samaritan woman alone, in the middle of the day at a public place. And his response stirs her curiosity. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew who it was that's talking to you, you'd ask me for living water. You see, all through this conversation, especially early on, she's talking about physical things. She's talking about pragmatic realities. And he's talking about spiritual life. And she, he, when he offers her living water, is talking about offering her a way to get connected to the God of the universe. You remember that verse in Psalm 46 that says, there's a river whose streams make glad the people of God. God's in the midst of her. She won't be moved. That verse is talking about the flow of the Spirit of God who is always on the move. The current flows It's alive. Have you walked in strong current in the springtime where the water pushes you, it propels you, maybe even lifts you off your feet? Living water, he's saying. I can give you living water. And she responds, that'd be really good. I wouldn't have to come out here anymore. Why don't you give me that living water? And then he comes right into where the wounded area is. You see, if she's going to receive living water, you've got to deal with her stuff. So he says, well, go get your husband. I don't have a husband, she says. No. He knows it all. You had five, and now you're with a man who you've not covenanted with in marriage. You're a prophet, she says. Do you ever get unsettled by the truth that Jesus knows all about you? ever get ashamed, embarrassed by the reality that there is someone who always knows not just the exterior behavior, not just the attitudes that are observable, not just the words you speak. He's knowing your brain. He knows what flows in your spirit. Yeah, he's a prophet, all right. He knows. But he doesn't reject her or disengage from her. So they have this conversation about where you worship, how you worship. She's thinking about place. You know, like you'd say, well, I worship at the old Baumgars building. I still tell people, I'm the pastor of Faith Lutheran, and when they have a question mark in their eye, I say, it's the old shopper supply. And then the, li- then the eyes go, oh, yeah. Where do we worship is not as important as who we worship and why. And so she says, my ancestors worshiped on this mountain. Jews, I know, say Jerusalem. Jesus said, you need to worship in spirit and truth. When the Messiah comes, we'll know it all. And then he says, I am he. Literally in the language, he says the same as what God said to Moses at the burning bush, I am. Jesus reveals himself and she is lit up. It changes her. It changes her life that she's encountered the Messiah, the God, who knows all about her, but now is there encountering her. You see, Jesus doesn't care about boundaries or gender 
or cultural differences, even religious confusion or religious differences. He's just going to reveal himself because he comes as Messiah to set us free. Think of the Gospel of John now. He reveals himself to the insider, Nicodemus, and says, you got to be born again. But he also says, now to this soiled dove, this lady who's been through so much in her life journey that she's ostracized to the point that she's alone in the middle of the day, drawing water. And he says, I'm your God. I'm here for you. Her life has changed. Jesus pours himself into her and the Spirit comes into her. I want to parenthetically now explore, like Eric did with the kids, how you and I can learn things about Jesus' technique of sharing living water with another person. I want you to think about how your life could in fact be a divine moment for someone else where your words, your witness, your approach to them could be a means where the Spirit works. What do we learn from Jesus? First, he does not judge her or reject her. Yet he knows everything about her. Second, he meets her where she is as she is. It's a point in time, but he's not fussy about where we are when we encounter him. I don't know where you're at today, but I guarantee you that the Lord Jesus wants again this morning to say, my child, I love you. I pour my grace out to you. Rise up and live in my love. Let my love for you light up your life and go from this place full of hope and joy. He meets us where we are as we are. Third, and here's the hard one for busy people, he's open and flexible to take the time. Fourth, he's not blocked by prejudice. Religious, gender, racial, it doesn't hold him back. Fifth, he's honest to speak the truth to her without judgment. There is a need, you know, to speak the truth. Sixth, am I sixth, seventh? He sheds light on her limited spiritual knowledge in order to bring her to a full realization of who God is. And he offers her himself. So in the divine moments, if God were to use your life, there's a moment at which you and I would have the opportunity to say, I love Jesus because he's the one who is my purpose for living. He's my God, and he can change your life. Those moments will come. So the living water flows to her and cleanses away all that's stagnant and foul. She was stuck thinking she had no future, but now her future is opened up because the Messiah Jesus with his living water can heal all that was broken by her misdirected life. And I don't know where the woundedness is deep inside you from past stuff that you wish had never happened, but I know that the Lord Jesus, in his love, still is at work healing hearts. He gave her new life, and he gave her joy. Worship is every time we encounter the Lord Jesus. He is the great I am. And she then becomes an unlikely witness, like Eric with the dominoes. She becomes the unlikely witness to go to the village. Do you think the whole village knew the type of woman she was? You better believe that they would have. And so, how powerful would it be that that woman who lived by definition of the religious people an immoral life, that woman would say, my life has changed. I met the Messiah, the deliverer of God. He told me everything I've ever done, but he loved me. She was so pumped about having met Jesus. Did you notice 
when Greg read the gospel, that she left her water pot at the well? She didn't even carry the water home. (laughs) Right back to the village she went to say, I met Jesus. So I close with the request that you pray about whether God wants to use your life to be a witness for him. That God would use the encounters that you have, random or seemingly of no consequence or intentional, to change lives. Would you listen with compassion? Will you embody the love of Jesus and seek to bless them? Will you every day be conscious of the fact that you rub shoulders with people who are lonely and lost and who have, because of whatever reason, not stayed connected to the one who gave them life and loves them? Will you pray about who it is in your life that you might share the love of Jesus with? Keep your heart open. Don't judge. Pray to bless them. Find a connecting point. Listen with compassion. And tell them you're in love with Jesus. Who knows? But what this week, you might have a divine appointment. Are you thirsty this morning? Do you need again to be quenched with living water? Do you need to hear the truth again that you belong to God and that you're forgiven? Do you need again to let the Spirit fill you up and say, I'm a child of God. The Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God knows me my name and loves me. Are you thirsty? And are you willing to be used by Jesus?